Welcome to Fertility Talks, everyone. And this is Mary Wong, and I'm the best-selling author to Pathways to Pregnancy. I'm the founder and director of one of North America's leading wellness clinics called Alive Holistic Health Clinic in Toronto. And I'm an acupuncturist and your fertility strategist. And I'm super, super excited to have with us again, Dr. Ari Baratz. Welcome, and thank you for being here, Dr. Thank Baratz. You. Thank you, Mary, for inviting me. Uh, it's always a pleasure and honor to be in your audience uh, and to be part of your conversations because you're an excellent conversationist. You bring out the best in everyone, both patients and providers, uh, through the written word and through oral conversation. And so let me know what you want. I know you want, you want to talk about, but uh, you have a few, you slipped a few extra agenda items in there just before <laughs> we went live. But uh, again, I think there's always two opportunities during these fertility yes. talks. There's the yes. main agenda, which we want to talk about a specific area of um, poor responders that's evolving. Mm -hmm. And then secondarily, the, the hot topic, the elephant in the room, uh, COVID. Yes. And, uh, how, so, we can, how we can talk about that too. Absolutely. So what we're going to do, and uh, so right now it's live. And at the end of it, if you guys are coming in at different times, then you can actually go back to my YouTube channel, which is at uh, Meet Mary Wong, where you'll find it and we'll actually separate out and we'll create it like two episodes. So it'll be 179 and 180. So 179, we're going to talk about the new treatment for poor responders called Duo Stim. So I've mentioned it to some patients this week and they're like, whoa, what is that? So they're super excited to hear about it. And as you are, and um, actually before we go into the meat of all this, I need to introduce to you formally because not everybody knows who you are. I know I know and love you, but you know, there's, we have to introduce you to everyone else. So this is Dr. Ari Baratz and he is a reproductive endocrinologist and infertility subspecialist at Create Fertility. And he's a staff physician, department of OBGYN at Women's College Hospital and Sunnybrook Health Science Center, and also in the faculty department of OBGYN Division of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility at the University of Toronto. And Dr. Barat has been dedicated to women's health and reproductive medicine for over 20 years. I was like, oh my gosh, has it been 20 years already? Mm -hmm. Anyway, one of the, you're like one of the few physicians in Canada with the accreditation and the advanced level of training required for the care of people dealing with infertility and recurrent miscarriages. And just this week, was it this week that you, uh, the, you were voted in as the VP of Fertility Matters Canada? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's awesome. Congratulations. Of course, of course, like, you know, of course. Anyway. <laughs> thank you, Mary. Um, so really, I want to thank you for taking your time out of your busy day. And I know you're really busy. I know that. So I'm super excited to have you here. So um, let's not waste any time and let's talk about Duo STEM. And then afterwards, we're going to cover about, you know, what's happening now with the pandemic and if there's any um, changes or any expectations in terms of getting into clinics in general, and then I guess specifically with Create Fertility as well. Sure. Okay. So, uh, Duo. So let's talk about Duo Stim because that was uh, something that you wanted to talk about, and patients have become uh, more aware in the last couple of years. And mm -hmm. there have been a few publications um, in the last five years, but in particular in the last twenty-four months. So first of all, let's yeah. define what is duo stim and where does it fall into place so duo stim is really just a shortened it's an abbreviation of dual stimulation uh, that's what duo stim means and it really is a sub area of the approach to the or an evolving approach to the poor responder patient so poor responder patient it's not meant to judge ivf patients but poor responder typically is defined as um, women typically advanced reproductive age, so over 35 or over 40, women who usually through previous response demonstrate a low output of eggs to, to ovarian stimulation. And typically these women have um, low ovarian reserve parameters. For example, an AMH of less than, uh, less than seven or an antral follicle count of less than five to seven. So that's one definition set. I mean, there are different ways to define poor responder, which is one of the issues. So duo stim is a response to the poor responder. It's part of this emerging tool set that we have developed. 
So I think whenever you talk about anything in IVF, it's always nice to go back in time. Like why did these things develop and why do they evolve? So, you know, again, dual stimulation. So when we talk about duals, because many patients might say, well, why are you concerned about dual stimulation? I've done three IVF cycles, that's three stimulations. Yes, you have, but you've only done one stimulation per menstrual cycle or per program cycle. Dual stimulation refers to the fact that you're doing more than one stimulation in one cycle, which by definition, intuitively, you're likely gonna make more, more eggs. And so when we, we talk about uh, dual stimulation, uh, you need to go back to a bit of basic physiology which is for the longest time, the approach to reproductive physiology and the understanding of the way human eggs develop was out of something called the follicular phase or the initial phase of the women's reproductive cycle. And it was essentially dogma that you cannot stimulate women outside of that window. Uh, and then over time, there have been people that have questioned this. Uh, in particular, I think the one area that really uh, inspired this, well, there's two areas, but one clinical area was actually in the cancer population. So we have a group of women uh, who are going through cancer therapy who are on a very tight timeline to do their fertility preservation or their egg freezing cycles or embryo freezing cycles. And so when the oncologist says, you have to go for your therapy or you could have serious harm or have serious advancement of your cancer, you don't have a choice of time or programming. And so through that pressure, reproductive endocrinologists that deal with, with women who have, who have cancer or through cancer treatment, realize that you can actually stimulate even under duress at any time during the menstrual cycle and still withdraw eggs. And so through that experience, even though it was thought to be suboptimal, which in the initial studies, it did show that there was a suboptimal yield of eggs, at least it was the first hint that we could actually retrieve eggs from many points during the menstrual cycle, not just at that dogmatic early phase. So that was sort of clinical keystone step one was the cancer population. But, and I, I think I mentioned this before, and that, that's sort of a world, uh, a, a universal experience. Cancer centers all over the world have done this with women um, uh, in this situation. But then there's another inspiration, which is actually Canadian. Uh, and my, my good friend and colleague, Dr. Pearson from the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, and he, he looked at women uh, throughout various aspects of their, of their uh, menstrual cycle and, and was able to identify through ultrasound and blood that the wave of follicular development is not isolated to the beginning, to the follicular phase. In fact, there are multiple waves that develop through uh, the typical reproductive cycle and, and that these, and this was in natural cycles, but it wasn't a far-fetched uh, idea to think that maybe we could harness those multiple waves. So you put together that basic science identification with the cancer experience, and now you have dual stim because you have some physiology that supports it and you have clinical experience. You with me so far? So how long has this uh, been evolving from then? Since well, the, the biology, the studies for the biology are at least 20 years old. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, the cancer population, at least in the last decade, um, I would say the first published reports for duostim um, in sort of a, a premeditated way were sort of 2014 was actually the first um, the first paper. Uh, it was it was referred to as the Shanghai Protocol because yes. it was designed by people from China. In fact, the two major groups that are interested that initially phased um, this in were groups from Asia and groups mm -hmm. from Europe. So there are a lot of Italian and Spanish studies that have done that, and. I, I wonder if some of that pressure comes from the fact that these are very big referral territories and maybe when patients come to see them, they don't have a lot of time. But the other the other real important population is- Sorry, what, what do you mean by that when you say that? Well, it could be that some of these centers that develop this are yeah. taking care of patients that might be traveling from far away, so they don't right. have an unlimited amount of time with yes, them. Yes, of course. I, I suspect that, but, uh, yeah. but re the real genesis um, is the poor responder. The, uh, and, and so- Back to the poor responder, the poor responder is a very difficult area um, in reproductive care because, again, back to a core, core concept, we know that overall success for any couple, individual person that goes through fertility treatment is linked to the number of eggs that are generated um, as well as the number of normal embryos. And the more eggs, the more embryos, the higher likelihood of pregnancy over time. But now you have a poor responder who has challenges with that their pregnancy rates are going to be lower and then at some point will completely diminish if that re if that response goes away so interesting so then 
I'm thinking also of a, someone like with a PCOS background. Could that work for someone like that? Because they're stimming so many. And then even when you, right. you know, get the right sizable ones at retrieval, there's still so many that are just sitting there. Would that work for them? Well, that's an excellent question. So let's look back at the typical IVF patient that comes in to start their IVF protocol, mm -hmm. whether it was programmed, uh, but they would have been worked up. They would have had evaluation with their physician. They would have had ultrasound, ovarian reserve tests, AMH, FSH. Um, a history would have been taken. So there would be some kind of premeditated or expectation of how many follicles slash eggs would develop over their cycle. And as one stimulates and gets closer to the IVF egg retrieval and then ends up with the retrieval, you then get the output. You find out how many eggs were, were harvested. And so let's just use a simple number. Like let's say someone was supposed to get, you estimated uh, 12 follicles, they ended up with 10 eggs. Um, and so that's what you were anticipating, somewhere between 10 to 15 eggs. Right. We ended up with five. And you're like, whoa, that's a lot lower than what we expected. Um, but that patient was a PCO patient, or they were a younger female, or they had all of the metrics that would have suggested a 10 to 15 egg response. Mm -hmm. So we refer to that kind of poor responder as an unexpected poor responder, right? Someone that we were not prepared for that, right. um, but yet it happened. Let's take um, another patient uh, again, uh, this, but this patient, this patient ends up with five eggs, but they were um, someone who we, we anticipated that poor response or three to five eggs or a low egg number. The expected poor responder is different because we knew from the beginning, we had said to this person, you know what, you don't have... Uh, a high AMH, you have a low follicle count, you are over 40, you've, you've stimulated before with low response. Um, so those are two very different people. Now your question refers to the PCO who we would have expected, or sorry, they're an unexpected poor responder. Right. I actually think, even though there aren't many studies to support that, I think that's the kind of person who you might consider duo stim in because they're still in that cycle and you might be able to make up for those lost eggs that you didn't get during the first attempt. Yes. Um, so that's not really the poor respond, the, the expected poor responder, but it certainly is an area that you could consider. The issue with the PCO patient though, is there's a pretty good uh, chance that if they came back in a month or two, they probably would have a better response or more ideal response because you would likely, likely respond to that, meaning in the, in the unexpected poor responder, you have to look back at what happened, right? Was this, uh, like, let's say the PCO, was this person underdosed? Like, did she just not receive the right, right. amount of drug for the cycle? Um, was there some asynchrony in the follicle development? Like, w was there some kind of lead follicle that wasn't identified? Or was there some technical issue? Like, meaning you really were are targeting for 10 to 15, everything pointed towards that, and the retrieval just there was some mechanical failure the retrieval just wasn't working properly so i mean those are all possible explanations and they can be and you can react to those and then hopefully in a subsequent response ivf achieve that so that might not require dual stim because you could just wait a month so you're not in a position ever to you know right after the retrieval could say okay let's go time and let's do it again right or do you know you mean like with a couple of days later yeah, or, like, and then deciding right then on the spot afterwards, right. like after, I mean, you know? The problem, the problem is that dual stim is underpinned by, it's not your, just to clarify, dual stim is underpinned by that physiology that I mentioned from Saskatchewan, yes, so, which is that right. there's this, like, let's just use my fingers. So in the follicular phase, let's say there were five follicles that were coming up and then you harvested them. When you go for dual stim, it's not that you're going after a sixth or seventh that you didn't get during that first stim. It's that there was a second wave that came up that you that you're able to to capture. Um, obviously, on the outside of it, like on the outside end, you're looking at it as just my total number was ten or fifteen. I don't care which wave they came from. I want my ten or fifteen yes, follicles. Yes, of course, right. What's also interesting is that if you actually compare head to head, so if you just look at if you randomize women, and there was studies from the Italian, uh, either Spanish or Italian group that did this where they took a group of women and randomized them to either being stimulated exclusively in the follicular phase, so like the traditional IVF, yeah. or exclusively in the luteal phase. That's when the duostim occurs in the second half of the cycle. Yes. And they came out the same. So that's another sort of supporting evidence that suggests that you can stimulate women at any stage, but you might do better if you stimulate in both phases, if you took one woman and did that to, to, at, you know, at the same time. Um, so. 
Well, it, I don't know if it's crazy. It's just whenever you challenge, <laughs> whenever you challenge the status quo, yes. it really puts things into question. Um, look, I mean, I, I think there are, um, you know, obviously there are still some, some considerations like, Oops, are you still is there, there a cost benefit? Um, oh, hello. Yeah, you cut out for a second. That's okay. Oh, I think you're sorry. back on. Uh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, so you know, is there um, uh, you know, a cost benefit? Like, has this actually really does this really work out over the long um, over the long term? Um, you know, that's one of the considerations. Uh, is there any real difference in the quality of luteal phase? Um, eggs so far it doesn't look like there's a big difference patients have to appreciate that if they are doing dual simulation that they are foregoing uh, a, a fresh uh, embryo transfer that you can't transfer obviously if you're stimulating and yes. when you would normally be preparing for a transfer so those are uh, those are some of the considerations that have to be um, had but I, I would say some of the advantages are are very fundamental which is one of the biggest fears for any poor responder going through is will I run out of time? And so what dual stimulation does is it over time shortens the amount of time to harvesting a requisite number of eggs. Mm -hmm. It may actually provide that required inventory to have a second or maybe even third child, right? So it provides that, that expanded. And there is some psychological component to it, right? It, it, it's very often, I'm sure you've seen this with patients that when you're in that mode uh, and let's say you have a poor response, one of the biggest issues is when can I get back on? When can I get back to the clinic? And being able to bring people back very rapidly, I, I find very inspirational. And it does allow to for patient retention, uh, limits dropout. Like there are some non-physiologic, more psychologic enhancements. So, I mean, that's interesting because of course, some people are more sensitive in, with regards to like even emotional um, symptoms, right? So if you're being bombarded with stimulation drugs and they're already feeling out of sorts and then to stimulate again very quickly, does that impact them more mental, emotionally? Right. So um, you, made, you mentioned a few points there. Mm -hmm. So first point is bombarding them with drugs. So that's one of the key questions. Another key question with dual, well, with stimulation in general, yes. which is, and there's two camps with this, in the poor responder, should we be using high dose stimulation? And there are many studies that still support that. In fact, with the expected poor responder, there are some studies that even support going to older, more traditional protocols like long protocols using GNRH agonists. Uh, most of us will still use short protocols, but the idea of using a high dose versus more of a minimal stimulation approach, and, and our group has published a paper to support that. And there are other papers, excuse me, that have supported a paradoxical minimal stimulation for the poor responder. And then when you look at dual stimulation, those both of those protocols can be used in dual stimulation. So you can use minimal stimulation one after the other, or you can use right. high dose stimulation one after the other, and both have worked. So that's mm -hmm. another question mark, is what is the ideal um, stimulation for duo stim? Right. Uh, I've done both. Um, based on certain circumstances. I still am, I mean, I'm trying to assimilate all this data as well, just like any practitioner. Sure. Um, most, if, if people are still responsive to traditional or high dose stim, they probably do a bit better with that to a certain limit. But if they've exhausted stimulation or not responding or at a personal preference, then we will use a minimal, a minimal stim. So, so just a quick question then, because, you know, you're always going to do the baseline hormones and you see right from the get-go a person with a low AMH, a high FSH, and, you know, low uh, antral follicle count, you know, right from day one, are you then automatically now suggesting duostim? Or are you going to do a first round of regular IVF? And then if that fails, then yeah. you go to duostim. Well, there's a lot of factors that will go into this. Um, I think you alluded to it before. I usually refer to the three um, resources that we have are the three pillars of decision making, which are the medical input, um, the emotional psychosocial component, and the financial piece. So every person has sort of like a budget for each of those. So like medically, for example, as you said, some people just can't 
the idea of doing one IVF is really far beyond what they ever imagined, let alone doing one right after the other. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, even though complications with IVF are very minimal to nil, um, some responses are, are like just the patient response is not as good. People don't recover as well. So it might be hard to say to someone, come back in five days after they've missed three days of work because they're not happy how they felt after a retrieval. Uh, emotionally, again, some people do need that time out, that break just to process what's been going on or the opposite. Uh, some people feel that it's very empowering to roll into one. Uh, and then finally, financially, even though the cycles are happening one after the other, they still are two IVF cycles. And now that we have more provinces that are funding IVF, like Quebec and PEI and, and Ontario, it might be possible, but for some people that that rapid uh, deployment of resources may not be able. So am I suggesting it? I, you know, I, I'm a real firm believer. We've talked about this um, patient-centered fertility care, patient-centered medicine. I, I don't think dual stim is for everybody, mm -hmm. but it certainly is a great option for people who are able to assimilate all of those um, uh, influences. So then in terms of actual outcome, are you having any differences in outcome from patients utilizing the OSTIM versus the Well, standard? it's been it's been well established and we've even seen this in our experience that patients ultimately are going to do better because they're, well, it depends how you define better, but we usually define it as the shortest time to live birth. And right. the more like the more rapidly that you develop a higher cohort of eggs, a, a, a larger group of normal embryos, you're going to be pregnant more rapidly. So patients doing duostim are definitely exiting the clinic more quickly. Uh, but, you know, again, it's not like we've been doing enough of it in the, in the, in the recent time to, to comment any further. We're still gathering our data. Sure. Uh, the onco, in the oncofertility group, which is where part of the start of the cancer group, not all those women have gotten pregnant because they're, a, lot of it's, a lot of the material is frozen. Uh, but all of the re published research is definitely supportive of um, enhancement of pregnancy, certainly these poor responders. In fact, I mean, these are groups with very low pregnancy rates to begin with, but some studies have shown a doubling of the number of um, embryos or even doubling of pregnancy rate. So some studies have shown like single digit pregnancy rates moving into double digits. Uh, and so these are from the Spanish group, so or Italian group rather. So I, I mean, I, I think that that's really encouraging. The problem is it's not like we have massive, massive data sets, but the way I interpret that is this is not hurting people. That's always the first principle of medicine is I don't want to do anything that's going to result in some kind of catastrophe or uh, some kind of harm. The next principle is do good. Are we, are we helping people? And so far it looks like we're not hurting them and we may be helping them. I think we'll have to wait and see what the next year shows, but, um, but so far it is quite encouraging. Wow. How long have you been utilizing it? At your well, again, for cancer, dual stim has been around for a while. Um, I would say this year, because there was another influencer for dual stim, which was COVID. And that, that might be a nice uh, okay. dovetail in there. Because yeah. another reason many people are feeling, and, and providers are feeling a lot of anxiety um, about how long will their clinic stay open? Will there be a shutdown, uh, either on a, a macro level or a micro level, right? Because all the, all the procedures mm -hmm. that we're doing on the patient side and the provider side are subject to uh, either deferral or cancellation based on COVID exposure. Right. So you can imagine, I mean, obviously COVID can hit at any time, but you're less likely to get hit with COVID if you're doing your cycles over a shorter period of time. So I think that's inspired some uh, couples and individuals to to move more quickly. So this has been a really a, a tough year because a lot of the year was, was full of pauses and starts and stops and restarts. Uh, but I, I would say over the last six months, uh, I've noticed an, an increased request. And I, I actually had to look back at some literature to, uh, to initiate um, the protocol. Oh, so meaning the patients come in doing their own research well, and then they're requesting it? Well, I was always, I mean, I was always doing it sort of selectively for people, like I said, coming from far away that were here for a little while. Right. But I always, I always felt that like a rest, one or two months rest was appropriate for patients that were from here. But then as some of these other papers came through this year, I started thinking, you know what, maybe this, this isn't a bad thing to sort of launch on a pilot basis. And, and now we're, we're starting to do it more and more. 
Wow. Okay. So you know what? Um, I know that there's some people here online and everyone's very quiet because it's all so new, but if there's any questions, we'll welcome that right now. And then in the meantime, for those that are just joining us, we've been talking about duo stim IVF for um, more appropriate for poor responders and especially in this kind of climate of pandemic. So we're going to segue right into the second piece, which is, you know, latest update for fertility uh, treatments during a pandemic, which is so relevant, right? And right. Um, and as you using this as part of the protocol. And um, again, if you just started joining, this is Dr. Bratz with us. And um, have you noticed, is there more people at the clinic? Is there less people? Like, how are you guys doing at the clinic? It, I mean, just from the outside looking in, it seems across the board, it's more difficult and takes more time to get in with physicians. Uh, How well, is... before, before I answer that, I just want to clarify something, <laughs> which is that we've had a lot of firsts on Mary Wong Fertility Talks. Is this the first time that you've had one speaker do two talks? Yes. Okay. I just want to clarify. I want that to go down in the Mary Wong record <laughs> book because I was, I was the first to bring on three people. We did the try yes. discussion. Yes. You're right. Um, and now I'd like to know we were probably one of the first people in Canada to talk about COVID-19 on a, a broad fertility. We were very quick to talk about that. I know. Um, and you're, oh, and I, I wanted to also, just before we go in, I just wanted to, you reminded me of one other thing. <laughs> um, back to du dual STEM. There's actually another paper that came out recently that talked about tri-STEM. Tri -STEM. Holy so, cow. And, and that's back to the cancer group. Because again, if you're being given a hard line by the cancer yes. doctor that says, we are going to be doing the chemotherapy on December 15th, Right. then, and you have three weeks to do, or four weeks, whatever, to do whatever you need to do, or sometimes you need longer, obviously. Um, there has been cases of people going through three stimulations between the period and the resolution of the, of the stimulation. So, I mean, it, there's an amazing plasticity of, of uh, follicular recruitment that's possible. That's amazing. And you can think about it, in that case, you know, the cancer is an extreme case because there is no tomorrow. It's not like we can come back the next day and, and try this again. It's, it's either that that is the that is the cohort of eggs until emerging therapies develop in the future. But for now, that's that's all they get. Okay, so let's I, let's bring this really, really, really practical. It just it just came to mind. Yeah. So here you are in a normal IVF cycle. You take the stimulation drugs. You know whether it's long protocol, short protocol. At the end of the day, you're taking stimulation drugs. You go and get that retrieval. They take out the eggs, and then how many days in between? What's happening in between before you start going again? Right. So uh, there's a few there's a few things that are are happening. I mean, again, we talked about duo stimulation. There's also other modifications that have happened in IVF in the last year or so. You may have had people talk about dual or double triggers or different trigger medications. So that does also influence what happens after the retrieval. We're going to do that another time. We're going to no do problem. That another no problem. Time. But most women, I'm happy to talk about that as well. But most women, uh, most women, usually get a period within about a week and a half to two weeks from their retrieval. Um, so what, what happens in Duostim is instead of waiting, and that would be an opportunity to come back to the clinic and maybe consider doing another IVF or, or programming the next one. With Duostim, we usually program when patients will come back. So they do their retrieval on, let's say, a Monday, and then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, four days, come back Saturday to start again. So um, it's just a four or five day gap. Mm -hmm. there, there's probably not gonna be a bleed and then we go right in to the next. So we start the drugs again, same protocol, uh, whether it's min or or or, mat or traditional stimulation. Uh, and then the next retrieval will happen again a week and a half later. So, so then, I, just question then. And are you recruiting the ones that have maybe just haven't really quite developed, what, but was within the first round? Well, so there's there's two theories. So there's two okay. theories. So okay. back to the original biology. The original theory is no you're actually recruiting another wave that's just like picture being on the beach and seeing waves roll in but then between the big waves you see another you see other little waves right mm -hmm. so think of the big waves as the follicular but then those other hidden waves are these luteal waves that are existing we just they're not as big because they're being masked by the other ones so that's the best way to kind of explain that there's these multiple rolling waves yes. and they're not they're not four weeks apart or two weeks apart they're sp spaced differently um, and so it's probably a unique set, but one of the other theories that's going on with dual stim 
is that maybe that first stimulation is almost like a prime, like it's getting the second wave ready because there were a few studies yes. that showed more eggs coming out in the luteal phase. Oh, so it could be that there's like, it's almost like a sacrifice fly, like in baseball, <clears throat> excuse me, someone or that first wave is prepping the second wave. So that's the other idea. We don't know um, exactly. It's probably a combination of the two. Right, right, right. I, I think of it as like, you know, a slow grower and then, or a late bloomer. <laughs> they need a little bit more yeah. prompting or something and then comes and gets. I, I mean, there, there are other situations in IVF, more in the emergency situation, where let's say um, a patient was going through, they were all prepped and there was something wrong with their, um, their trigger. So when the physician went in to retrieve the eggs, no eggs were coming out, empty follicles. Yes. Uh, and so sometimes what we do is we do like kind of an emergency trigger and then move the retrieval off by a day and a half. That's two retrievals, but that's going after the same eggs, right? That's, that's going after that same cord. So that's not dual stimulation. That's just um, sort of salvage protocol to try and harvest harvest eggs right, right. but the so other thing I, think, I love yeah. that you said that so empty follicles doesn't necessarily mean that there's no follicles it's just it hasn't actually um been ripened so to speak so you get to well, go, go at them again right there is, that... there is a theory that some follicles are genuinely empty but for right. that, usually there's there are eggs there it's just either they're compromised or they haven't been properly uh, luteinized mm -hmm. but um the other um issue with uh, dual stim now with our modern triggers is that many women are being triggered with HCG hormone, but now that we're moving towards non-HCG triggers, namely using Lupron, like a GnRH agonists, right. they have actually shortened the time from retrieval to period. So even in dual stim, it is possible that a woman does get a period very close or during the second stimulation. So uh, either way, these waves of follicles are coming. And, and you can harvest them pretty much at any point during the cycle. So that's the key take home is this dogma of um, uh, unilateral stim protocol is not true. There are many opportunities. Got it. Uh, and uh, I think to go further, uh, if you're a poor responder, this is just another opportunity for you potentially. And, and remember, as I mentioned, dual stim is just like one line in this mm -hmm. whole kind of approach to the poor responder. So the right dosing, the right protocol, the right drugs, um, using adjuvants like um, androgens, like DHEA, COQ10, possibly growth hormone. So there's there's many tools that we've developed that come from all the different data sets, and Duostim just kind of fits, I think, fits quite nicely into that into that toolkit tool set. Well, it's interesting because then I, when you talk, speak to this, then I go back to oh well, you know, we use acupuncture throughout the whole time. Because as I always say, it's like, we want to juice up those eggs. Kind of like when people take CoQ10, PQQ, you want to, you know, increase that antioxidizing um, agent to help, hopefully, the quality of the eggs, right? So we want to utilize acupuncture in the same way. And it's basically consistent utilization of it to help increase the blood volume over to the ovaries and hopefully the uptake. Well, I think where your your work back, to, now we're sort of moving just into the poor responder, mm -hmm. where your work is, is quite critical and essential is you're, you're doing stuff not just at the point of care, but the, the pre and the post. And the whole idea of the prime, um, doing something in advance of the stimulation to prepare the patient, whether it's through lifestyle, ACU, TCM, growth hormone, DHEA, COQ10. The idea that the ovarian biology starts weeks and months before right. we actually do the harvest. Yes. Um, so that I, I think that's a, a critical piece here, here too. I, I mean, no one, I don't want to ever paint the picture that the poor responder uh, is an easy situation uh, just because we mentioned a few tools. Uh, it is very difficult, uh, meaning we know that even in, in, in women that are over 40 and women that are poor responders, if they can make a normal embryo, they'll do just as well as a younger woman. The problem is getting to that normal embryo, uh, that euploid blastocyst is so challenging. Um, but we also know there are other alternatives that, that are beyond this discussion, but we have other ways of approaching that too. So I'm just very mindful of women sitting in this conversation and hearing the words repeatedly, poor responder, poor responder. And I just think of the psychological impact because words, you know, they make meaning out of it. And I just want to be clear that it doesn't reflect who you are as a human being, that there's anything wrong with you. Okay. So it's just a medicalized terminology and, you know, the regular standard 
uh, protocols may not be so sufficient in how it, it works as optimally for you. Doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you, but you know, there, it, the truth is there is challenge and you know, the reproductive world is looking at different ways to help optimize this scenario. So I love it that the duo stem is available and thank you for enlightening me because you know, I've heard about it and I've had patients do it and I'm, I've learned a little bit on my own, but just to hear it from you. It's yeah, I, I, want, I want to sort of back up your point, which is that none of the comments that we're making here, I mean, yes, we did talk a bit about the cancer population as an example group, but that aside, um, using duostim, using these terms, these do not speak to the ability to carry a pregnancy. They don't speak to someone's overall health. Um, these are very peculiar to IVF stimulation and they're terms that are just used for that. They're not meant to qualify that person. They're not judgment. Um, they're not actually commenting on the quality of the eggs. There is some data that suggests that as ovarian reserve does go down, that there may be issues with making normal embryos or it's more, more, it's more difficult. More challenging. Yes. More challenging, more difficult. Yeah. But, 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 but all of these comments are very specific to stimulation. They're not about uterus. They're not about ability to carry. And I think that's a really nice dovetail into your second talk, which is <laughs> you want to talk about COVID-19. Yeah.